I just wonder if they can hear me online. You can, is that you, Diane, you can hear me? I don't hear you though. What's going on, uh, Devin? All right. Let's see if I, I didn't check to see if uh, my PowerPoint would load up. So we have Vanessa with us. She's not online this time. Class 10. So I have to start talking about yesterday's, last week's class. It was really tough for people and I, I want to make sure we kind of did a little. I think, well, we'll have to ask Tyler. Tyler's in charge of that. It's the same link, but on the page, it has all the different, there's no, it just says class one, class two, class three. So it doesn't really, um, I think it's missing, kind of people get, don't know what, what class number was that. Huh, so why is it doing this? I will open this one. I get all of them. If I open this one, I finally get all of them. Okay. This one will be much more, much more reasonable, this class. Because that one was really like a th the theological classes that we get for seminary. Um, and it was really pretty painful for, for even myself to teach it. You know? Is that right? Well, good. You don't really need it. Right, Diane? Wasn't last week's pretty painful? Last week's class. You gotta, if you unmute yourself, there you go. You need me to turn the volume up here? Can you speak now, Diane? No, you can't speak. I can't oh, hear now you. I got gotcha. you. Now we got gotcha. you. Can you hear me as well? I can hear you very well, Arlette. I thank you very much. I had to do some new stuff on my computer, so I was playing and panicking. It wasn't too bad, Father, because I had read some of that stuff, the basic for theology, to yeah. Frank G. I read his book prior. Well, about a year ago. Oh, good. I don't know how clarifica clarifying it was, clarification it was. <laughs> because I think I was going to try to get, we're going to talk about kind of just what you needed to get out of that. That's really what I think. More importantly, I was going to, I went to bed, I woke up the next morning frustrated with myself that it didn't, it wasn't clearer to, to everybody, you know? But that's my wicked way, is that I can't let it go. Egg, that's exactly what I think. You're all looking at me like this, like, okay, either I am not paying any attention anymore to you, uh, Yeah. It's a holiday today. I wonder where all my friends are in the row. Am I going to have to move down to the second row, make the second row the front row? Because nobody sits in the front row? I know. Where's my front row crowd? It's hard to see you face to face. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, now she's got a new friend, huh? She knows who you are now. Because while I was gone, Cece was staying with Denise. She's going to the vet. My cat is looking for her. Oh, yeah? My friends are deserting me. I knew that was too rough of a class yesterday, last week. Come on, guys, let's see some people online. See, Martha Frank's on. Martha, where, how come I don't see you? You've got to put your camera on. I'm out taking a walk right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's at least Sheila. Got it, all right, Martha. Is it that warm up there? It's gorgeous right now. Really? About 50, yeah, about 50-ish. Nice. All right, it's about 6.30. This one's going to be much more interesting because we'll, we'll talk specifically about the Bible. Everything I talk about, you should already know. Anyway, in this section of the Scriptures. All right, so let's start with a little prayer for everybody, all right, online and everything, and we'll uh, see if they come in a little later. You're all alone in the front row now, man. All my friends deserted me now. They were just a little too overwhelmed. All right, so let's start with it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to open our hearts to how your Son came to us and the message he left us, May we uh, be open to what you have to tell us. Most importantly, open to seeing things a new way because of how much we've learned about you and your Son. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So for those who are getting online now, and just to remind everybody that, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I have a little obsessive compulsive behavior uh, problem. And so, of course, after the class yesterday, I, woke, I went to bed thinking about it. I woke up the next morning. All week last week, I was going to give you a handout that was going to describe everything. And uh, I didn't do any of it. So, <laughs> But because then I decided what I would do is just leave you with that section. That section uh, of the, it, 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 that the church has in the catechism is specifically to go over what the church worked out in the fourth century, third, fourth, fifth century, about Jesus and who is Jesus. Today, you take almost all of that for granted. You don't even care about the nature of Christ or the, you know, if he had a will, if he didn't have a will. It's all been worked out. And uh, the church has come out and said, now this is how we believe. And, but there were big fights in the early church. Matter of fact, they were excommunicating all kinds of people over this because what they needed to work out was, who is Jesus? Who is this person? And how could he really save all of us? And that's why they wanted to figure out how much, you know, how is he both human and divine? What does it mean? Does he have a human will? Does he have a divine will? Is he two persons? First in the Trinity? Was he three persons in the Trinity? What does it mean to be persons? And then it was, well, if then he has two natures. How can two natures exist in one person? All of that was worked out, and that's what that section is all about. What you don't, what's hard for people who have not studied it, they don't appreciate the creed. The creed where it, stalked, it speaks about I believe in Jesus Christ as the only Son, our Lord. You know, God, uh, God from God, light from light, true God from true. Uh, I got to remember what. Yeah, one in uh, consubstantial with the Father. All that stuff that we mm -hmm. that it's in the creed. I got I got another part of it. Is that that those those words were specifically chosen, and they were fighting over who who and to define who Christ is, and your questions. Whenever I do scripture study, your questions come up like that. Because all of a sudden you want to know, did Jesus know he was divine? Well, you want, you want, a lot of people ask that question. Did he know everything from the day he was born? Um, could he have had the opportunity to sin? You know, all these things that we ask, those are all worked out in that nature of Christ and truly human, truly divine. 
Um, and so you can go back and read that, but, and, and you know, I mean, we, we can have a whole semester. Matter of fact, this, this class is called, that you take in seminary that goes over all of this, is called Christology, the study of Christ. And it's a whole semester just going over and memorizing and clearly defining Jesus and his nature and how the church understood him. You probably, you don't need to know all of that. You just need to know that the church worked hard to figure that out. And it does have an answer. So when you start talking to some atheists, you, if you get to study it, you can be clearly, clearly define it. All right? So that was the point. And if ever you have any questions on any of that section, most of the time what happens in our church, somebody comes up with an idea. The idea is not correct. So therefore, the person, it, it, it's considered a heresy. And it helps. But these kinds of fights that happen in the church that are happening today, gender identity, all of that stuff, uh, uh, the whole fighting over contraception, the whole fighting over uh, same-sex marriage, we have a, a difficulty with all of that. People have a difficulty. Look, the church is always fighting. But if you take a look at a good history of the church, it's always done that. That's how it helps clarify Thing. Someone comes up with an idea, the idea seems contradictory, the church goes and studies it, it comes up with another idea, someone else comes up with another idea, and then the church begins to help define exactly how it, when, what it believes. And that's, for, for people who have a sense of history, that's not a bad thing. That's how the church works it out. The problem is, in the meantime, there's all this fighting and we hate fighting in the church. We actually hate a lot of fighting. We expect that Jesus would have told us somewhere in the Bible where about same-sex marriage. And he did not leave everything. He gave, though, the spirit to the church and said, as things come, you will, the spirit will guide you in this church, as long as you remain faithful to Christ. So I share that with you only because if you get a little more I want to, it's not a bad word, a little more mature in the faith, right? Lack for a better word, really, because it sounds, that someone's immature, sounds negative. But what I mean is you get more, uh, more background, more history, you get less, less frantic over things that don't quite always, don't have an answer yet, and the church will work it out. And it will work it out, and even bishops fight with each other. We have, you know, Cardinal Burke fighting with the bishop, with the Pope Francis, and all. Well, they did that every, they did that over the Eucharist, in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist in the 9th and 11th century, that you all take for granted, right? So it's okay to kind of help define some of these things. Let the church define them. And it'll only define them by fighting, by, by, fighting, by positioning papers, by going over and saying, I don't believe that, that's not right, oh, we, this, will, this is contradicts our history of our, of our faith, that kind of thing. So I don't have a problem with the fact that, you know, some cardinals are fighting with the Pope and they're trying to clarify what blessings you can do with this same-sex union and all of that because they're working that out. What, will, what can happen, what cannot happen? So maybe some would consider me just a, a little too optimistic about it, but I, you know... The church constantly gets divided over that. We still have Arians around over the Arian controversy of the fourth century, right? But the church says that's a heresy, so it's not an Arian. That's because she got cracked, that's why. All right, <laughs> so let's go with the business items. Remember to check the website, right? I got to do this. I have to do this because there's always new people, and I want to make sure everybody gets an idea. So up to the minute, I don't think there'll be any more snow cancellations, but you never know. Right, we got, we, got, we got till the end of April, right? <laughs> Just remind everybody to sign up for the email because you told, told you things were happening tonight, all right? And uh, tells you if there's a class that's canceled and if you watch it online, that's the best. So, huh, this is not my new one. Which it, no, this is not even the one I had. Let's go back, sorry. Uh, discard that. Uh, this is not my class, I'm class 10. This one. There we go. Downloading recent changes. All set. Let's set this in. Uh, there we go. From the start. Put this on. Ah! There we go. 
that I want, and I want that. So, just a reminder that these are all the catechisms, also the catechism online. So, remember that we are in the profession of faith, which is the very first section, all right? And uh, it's under the dogma and creed, because there are four sections, right? Dogma, creed, then there's the sacraments, and then there's the morality, and then spirituality or prayer life. Those are the four big parts. If you've got the colors here, you'll see that it's blue, maroon, green, and purple. All right, so if you have those, those are the four parts and the gold is just uh, appendices, all right? So we are only going to cover, I, I, have a, I was very ambitious, but when I put this together, I was like, okay, I can't get all that undone. So I realized that I cut it down a bit. So we're only really doing paragraph three, which is, which is five, 512, to 570, all right? So we're gonna do 60 of them, 58, 57 paragraphs, all right? Which is just paragraph three, the mysteries of Christ. So remember that in the section that we are in, we are in the profession of faith. The profession of faith is gonna go through the creed, the apostolic creed, that's where you get, see, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, all right? And then we'll go, we'll go into the rest of the creed. But so these are, these are the, the, um, the major topics. And then you can see that articles actually go right through the creed. And then Jesus Christ is only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary. So that's what we're going to cover today. All right, because only in paragraph three, though, because we already did that part. So when you take a look at the creed, you'll notice that I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. There's nothing in the creed about his life, right? He died, he was born, and then he died. Because in the fourth century, third century, they were figuring out who Christ was. They were less concerned about his life and much more concerned about who he is and the incarnation and the, and the suffering death and resurrection and the salvation. So those are the two big things we're talking about in the creed. We don't even talk about anything else that he taught in terms of that. So that's what's really interesting is the creed only speaks about Jesus's birth. This is number 512, by the way, if you want to. It talks about his birth and his death. Nothing about what we call his hidden life. His hidden life is the life before he started to preach. If you notice that there are, you know, there is the, the infancy narrative. Then we have in Luke just the 12-year-old story of being lost in the temple. And then all of a sudden he's on the scene and baptized as a 33-year-old. So what happened between, you know, zero or, and that little 12 thing and then all of his life? How did he, what did he do growing up? What is that? What's going on with that, right? We don't have anything. But one of the things I want to share with you is if you start reading some people, they will tell you that there are some other gospels out there. You can look at all these Gospels. The Gospel of Thomas will talk about his early life. And uh, we, don't consider those, uh, we don't consider those Gospels in the canonical sense, but you're free to read any of them. I, if you read them, they're absolutely, some of them are actually crazy. I mean, that's why the church did not consider them uh, inspired. One of them is, I think, um, you know, G uh, Jesus saw a bird that died, and he went and he made the bird come back to life. Uh, there are a couple of them. I should show you some of the strange stories in there. Um, I think he got into a fight with one of the kids or something. I think he, I think he, he, he did something on the Sabbath uh, as a little child. You know, it was, it was you'll see. I, it's kind of interesting. Just look at the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas Iscariot. There's the Gospel of Mary. There's the Gospel of uh, his wife, Jesus' wife. The Gospel of Jesus' Wife. These were all much later. Most of them considered, they're all, none of them are considered historical or anything. And they're all, they're all kind of strange sayings. And some of them have Jesus killing people. It's a weird kind of Gospels. Um, and then, so what happens sometimes is you'll see like, oh, Time Magazine will have the picture. The Gospel of Thomas. The, 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 the unknown Gospel or whatever that the church didn't accept, right? But go and read it. And then you'll be like, well, okay, I, that doesn't sound like anything that anybody would have accepted as, as part of a, even anybody's life. It was really, they're weird kind of things because they're considered kind of ones that were written much, much, much later 
uh, and for different kinds of reasons. So I don't need to get into that, but you could go look at them yourself. They're all on the internet. And you can get a nice little book of all the forgotten gospels. Now the church does not consider them because them actually even have the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So we, that already it's not considered a gospel because that was one of the requirements in the early church of the gospel. All right. And it often had Jesus as much, 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 much more divine and less human, you know. So doing all kinds of fantastical things, you know, almost like a you know, magician or something. So you're free to go. If you're interested, go look at them. I started to read a couple of them. I might even have them in my history. I'll pull them up if I have a little time because I'm only doing 50, 50 paragraphs today. So that'll, yeah, so it's a, about a minute per paragraph, okay? So I'm a little behind already. <laughs> okay, so that's 512, all right? So notice nothing of his life. So the focus will be on, uh, on this part will be on his hidden life today and on his public life, all right? That's what we will be talking about. So here is a classic picture of, uh, of you know, here's Jesus working with Joseph, you know, in the, you know, in, as a carpenter, obviously not a portrait, I mean, not a, no iPhone picture, right? I mean, it's not very, but he's got his little, he's got his, his uh, zucchetta on, or, you know, I um, uh, forgot the name of it. Yeah, yamaka, right. Zucchetta is for the bishop, right? You know, um, so, and he, you know, as a, as a good faithful Jew, as it's trying to portray in this picture, which I just found on the internet, all right? So what happens is we're going to focus, this is considered kind of his hidden life. The Gospels were written by primarily the Gospels that we have them. This is 515, by the way, 515. They were written primarily uh, by people who had faith, and their purpose was to communicate the faith, to share the faith with others. It wasn't meant to be a biography, like we have the biography of Ronald Reagan, right? It's people of faith who are handing on faith. And sometimes when people approach the gospel like a biography, they forget that, it, that, that it, it's not a journalistic approach. These people believed and they were passing it on to other believers, the great stories on 515. So everything that's in the gospel, we say, is for your salvation only. It's not for you to have a you know, number one time bestseller biography of who Jesus is, right? Because all that was in communicated in the gospel, as we say on 515, is solely for your salvation, all right? Now, we also say that everything in Jesus's life, absolutely everything that was communicated about Jesus's life is the sign for us and mystery. It's a part of the mystery. It all points to his mission and our calling to follow him. So that's what we're going to focus on. The mysteries of Jesus' life kind of reveal to us based in these stories that are communicated. So Christ's whole life, a lot of times they just look at his, his birth and his death, like the, like the creed does. But in our faith, everything that he experienced is a communication and manifestation of God to us. Because he says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Right? So if ever, if whatever we know about Jesus is what was to be communicated to us about who God is. That's why some people are like, you, you know, you know the mind of God because Jesus revealed a lot of things about the mind of God. So the whole life of redemption of Jesus and all of his works, uh, even before the cross, was about communicating to us. So here we go. In 517, they give you these. He became poor. He came, the fact that he came in to a stable, right, and a very poor and humble beginnings in order to enrich us, to teach us about the, about the poverty and of, you know, that the God's trying to commission. Then we talk about his submission of his growing up years, right? Why? They say he was obedient to his parents, right? That was very important. Now, they say that that is should automatically when you hear the word that Jesus was obedient a lot of times we think of you know Lord let it be done unto me according to no I mean uh, not my will but your will be done right when he faithfully took up the cross but remember that way back at the beginning 
the scriptures say he was obedient. He was obedient, which means that, that he began the process of reversing the disobedience of the first parents, right, of Adam and Eve and their disobedience. So Jesus already begins to foreshadow the fact that obedience is an important part of faith. He purifies us, you know, who hear it in his healings and exorcisms was how he took off our, our infirmities, as he said, when we say that about the death and resurrection. He began the process of, of, uh, of, of dealing with, uh, with Satan in the world by exorcisms and his resurrection to justify us. So in 518, there's a big important word here, recapitulation. That's a, that's a theological term. It's also in music, right? And there's other places to use it. But for theologically, the recapitulation of Jesus is kind of a, like a, we say a short summary, you know, or the, this is where I, I put it in here. Stresses Christ's role as the last Adam, the one who came to undo the curse brought about on humanity and the world's first Adam's sin, by the first sin. And he undoes it by living it and doing it differently, okay? So what we're going to say about what got screwed up in humanity, Jesus is going to live it, and by living it, he's going to reverse it, all right? So he's going to take it on like he takes on all of humanity, but he's going to, be, he's going to reverse it. So if I were to say that, any thoughts about something very quick about how maybe Jesus is reversing something that went wrong. Anybody? Any thoughts about Jesus? About something that was in Jesus' life? Jesus has to do that and reverse it. Um, well, there, there's a lot of, like, metaphorical um, between, like, like, crossovers between the Old and New Testament. Like, we know that Adam and Eve, it probably wasn't, like, the fruit is a metaphor of a sin, that, of the first sin, right? And that, that came from a tree, and then Christ died on a tree, because the cross is, so it's like the, the, the crossover is like that the symbolism. Right. Back and forth between the Old and the New Testament. Right, so when you take a look at, uh, when you take a look at, go ahead, sorry, yes, very good, because it's going to be, he's going to relive the history of Israel. He had to be tempted and refuse it. Exactly, there's one very quick one, to, right, so he goes into the desert, and he's tempted, right, and, and then he reverses us giving into temptation, that's one of the clear, easy ones, right, that is very, like, in your face, yeah, he's going to do it again, but he's going to do it better than we did it, and what he's going to do is take it all on and redeem it, this sort of exodus into the desert for the, um, uh, for the Israelite people, you know, and he's going to go into, they're going to go into Egypt, and there's going to be the massacre of children, and the same was with, with uh, Pharaoh, right, and, and he's going to come, so he's going to, you're going to see like him going through the same kinds of things that everybody, every, that all the Jewish history would, went through as well, and, but he's going to experience it in a very short distance, short time, and then make it holy, all right? So recapitulation is, so he restores our, our, and that's one of the ways we say he restores our fallen nature, all right? And, and so, and we, he recovers the things we lost in life. So as we, as we go through the gospels, we recognize, oh my gosh, he does the same things that we are doing problem is there's also the hidden life so that's one of the reasons why we say he was born right why people say why didn't jesus just come down you know if he's god right why did he have to be born in a stable and and sanctify children's lives by becoming a child right and then learning and sanctifying learning sanctifying the home life you know, becoming, sanctifying all of what it means to be human, you see, and, but, but doing it the right way, all right, so, one of we say is that, very important, that in Jesus doing this, Jesus died, all that he did, everything that he did, was for, and this is number 519, everyone, 
every single person, not just those people who accept him as his Lord and Savior, but we say that he did this for everyone. That's in the catechism now, all right? So even now in heaven, he still does, we believe, things for everyone before the Father. He still intercedes for us. He's still our advocate. So he did all of this for us, all right, and for everyone. That's 519. So he's, and he's still doing it for us now. He's still kind of calling us and, uh, you know, being our advocate to the Father. And then he, so he is also in his life became a model for us. So we say, since we say that Jesus was the perfect man, therefore in 520, he says he gave us an example of to imitate. So his obedience to the Father was not just to reverse it, obviously, of the disobedience, but then to model ourselves after him. So he gave us an example to imitate, you know, and in prayer and accepting the cross, we accept the cross. That should sound very easy for you, right, to accept that in our poverty, in his poverty, in his persecutions, as he was persecuted, that's one of the reasons why I always tell people, look, you know, they get all upset because they have these people who are persecuting them in the newspaper, right? Right? And they're like, can you believe it? I'm like, what do you think our faith is like? This is the, this is the way, you know? Uh, Jesus told you it was the way. And if, you're, if you don't want to be persecuted, then you're in the wrong religion because that's part of this religion. And that's, what, that's the model he gave. It's to stand up for the truth in the face of difficulty. So sometimes people are always saying, well, you know, it's really hard. I'm like, well, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no kidding, because do you get our model? I mean, he is the model on 520. Right? And it says that he accepted the cross. We accept the cross. He had that sense of poverty and detachment. We, have, we are to have that sense of poverty. He dealt with persecution to stand up for the truth, and so do we. So our goal is to follow him, model ourselves after him, and expect these things to happen. Right? And if you don't expect these things to happen, then you don't quite get it yet. I'm not sure what you think in religion is, what, what Christianity is. Or what you wanted is an easier one than Jesus, <laughs> easier life than him, right? I mean, like, it was good for him, but I'm not willing to kind of be a part of it. And, and it. and it's hard for all of us. I mean, we know it because we, we're at different stages of our lives. And, you know, I've come to, I used to hate it. And it's like, oh, I can't believe it. Why they would do such a thing? And I'm like, of course they would. This is the, this is the cosmic struggle between good and evil. And so, and the other one is, um, it's not, so the first one is that he came to die for all of us. This is five, this is under the communion of the mysteries, right? Our communion with him. So he came to do it for everyone and he still continues to do it. He did it for us. We, he became a model for us. And the third is he also offered us his life to join him in it, right? So he, we are to unite ourselves to him. That's 521. So we live with Christ, and Christ, we believe, lives in us. He is the vine, we are the branches. You know, that, that this divine life was offered to us. We're called to become in communion with him in that, to be one with him, as they say. Right? That's, that's the goal of the Christian life, these things. Are, right? So the idea is be in communion. So then the, the catechism moves to the mysteries of his infancy and his hidden life. So this was just sort of the, the introduction. I put this up on the board because the true history of the world is you realize that it's been long, right? There's a lot. So 522 talks about that the coming of Jesus as man was a big event in history, in world history, right? It affected the entire world. And this is 522. And God prepared for centuries for the coming of his son. Not just, you know, like, oh, it's the year zero now. Let's, you know, obviously that's not the way he worked. Walking around heaven saying, it's 
about time now, maybe this will be the best time ever to do it. But no time better than the present and zero, zero, right? No, just, no, that's not it. it, is that since the beginning of creation, Jesus, God knew the fall. God had already had a plan B, right? And the reason why he has a plan B, we already talked about in terms of freedom and all of that. And that plan B was to raise us even higher and it started. So by the time that garden was created, Christ was already going to be dying on the cross. It wasn't like, it's like, let's see if it happens or not, you know? Let's see when they do it. So all the rituals, all the sacrifices, the people and the symbols that we read about in the Old Testament of that first covenant were all to come together with Christ. They're all to come to become found. So that's why we say the Lamb of God because of the sacrifices of the lambs. And the, so what happens is that what we say about Jesus is, is, can go all the way back to the Old Testament and see prefigured that these events were going to, to happen in place in order for when year zero came, so to speak, I like to just say that in Chung and Chi, everybody would understand what was happening and, who Je and what Jesus was about. So the prophets announced him, right? And even, a catechism says in 522, even the pagans, the non-believers, the non-Israelites, the non-Jews were going to be ready to receive the message. And a lot of that is, I would say myself, is even through philosophy. You know, because you see a lot of, you see how Aristotle, um, you know, was, was um, uh, taken, I mean, um, Thomas Aquinas took Aristotle. We have Augustine who took, who, who was ready to take on Plato and all of the teachings of the pagan world and Christianize it. It had all been ready for it. So, then we now have, so we see the history, I'm saying that the life of Christ and the prediction comes in the Old Testament, both in the secular world as well as in the Israelite history, not just in, not just in the Israelite history, but also in the secular world. So then we have John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the church claims in 523, was the greatest and it was the last of the prophets. So all the self-proclaimed prophets of today are not prophets, right? John the Baptist was the last of the prophets. So anyone who still calls himself a prophet, they're not, they don't mean number one in this way, no, or nor on all these prophecies that you hear. I'm not a big fan, but I find all that bogus. I am not, I don't even sometimes, sometimes get frustrated when I'm not a good Christian and living my life and being patient. I don't even want to hear it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not interested in what, you know, this guy is prophesying about the world because I have the, the last of the prophets closed and I have Christ and nothing is better than that. So why would you settle for a C, D, and E when you got A, right? So that's why I, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Try to patiently listen, you know, but um, try not to kind of encourage that, that myself. Because John the Baptist, he announced that Jesus is coming. And when did he first announce Jesus is coming? For those who are looking in the catechism. When did he announce Jesus is coming? Not in the baptism. In his mother's womb. When he leapt for joy. Right? When he was in the presence of Jesus. So it goes all the way back to the womb. And then Jesus points out the Lamb of God and John bears witness to Christ, as we say in this preaching and baptism of conversion. And all of that is celebrated during our Advent season. That's 524. All right, so 524. And there's a little more that we'll talk about in that eventually, but about when he gets baptized. So this is a beautiful Christmas picture, even though we just celebrated it, right? But... In the Christmas story, we believe that there's the whole gospel. We call it a mini gospel. And everything that you see in this story of the Christmas, you know, of the coming of Christ, already anticipates the teachings of Jesus. First and foremost is his birth. The lowliness. That that's not just by chance. Jesus didn't just, God didn't just say, well, let me pick some poor people, you know, and, and that. But that was part of the, the teaching and poverty. The poverty of Jesus' birth with the shepherds that come and visit 
and the poor family is a manifestation of what, of what, was, what God is trying to communicate to us. Because everything is about that. Everything is about God trying to communicate to us. All right, so he set the pattern for when he, just by entering into this world, set the pattern right away that it's not going to be about worldly things. He didn't come in a palace. He didn't come as the great powerful king. He didn't, because that, and, and it's played out in all of his message, right? Worldly power, all of that. And it, the humbleness, and even, even in the, um, the thing from the, from the letter to the Philippians or the Colossians or whatever, you know, that he humbled himself and took the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men, right? Just the fact that he was God and he humbled himself, how, do, how does he make that teaching clear? He comes in in the poorest of families, right? Where they can only give two turtle doves. So that's very important. That's not just something to pass. That's why some we're good people and God will be nice to us, I hope. But it's hard. We live in a pretty, compared to a lot of people who are suffering, a lot of people, um, it's hard. So uh, for me sometimes to think of how many of us as Americans are, I don't know. I mean, some, I was born into this, but, you know, it is something about the choices we make. But, and then when you hear the gospel and the, you know, and the poverty and the humility that is a part of the faith. So the idea of our, our challenge to humble ourselves, you know, and Christmas is that, that also that divine exchange that, that God, who has sovereignty over everything, takes on humility, uh, in humility and, and humbleness, takes on his, uh, his own creation, right? So sh that alone is a huge kind of statement. We say that God became man so that we might become God. And what we mean by that is that there was a divine exchange, that God lowered himself to us, All right? And some people, you know, it's hard for them to believe because I think they... You know, it's even hard sometimes with the, with the church. Right? I think sometimes we have to really reflect on the, on the riches of the church sometimes and, and what does it mean. And um, there's beautiful art, which is very different, I think, because that's a that's different kind of thing that belongs to everybody. But sometimes, uh, you know, it, there is a business side to it that drives me crazy, you know, that it would be nice if I was a little, we were a little more struggling you know, um, of course, when you see the price of that tower, you'll figure out if you want to keep that tower over at Holy Family. When we find that out, it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix that thing. So, but that's the reality of our life, right? That that's what it costs. But you have to kind of work it out because it's in the gospel. So you got to, I think we've got to struggle with it. All right. So the infancy communicates to us teachings. Right? Not just what came out of his mouth in the teaching. We say that the, actually the things he did. So, one next one was circumcision. So, the increased in Christ's infancy. So, we have the circumcision. And what's important about the circumcision is it puts Jesus dead center in the covenant of, of Abraham and Moses and submission to the law. All right? And it's going to prefigure the sacrament of baptism. So Jesus didn't just drop down, right, and then start teaching. He comes out squarely out of the Jewish faith, right? And he himself submits to it by his circumcision. So therefore, we take seriously the Judeo-Christian faith, right? So the, and, um, and that it's however we want to understand what Jesus is talking about, we know we go, to the Jew, we go to the Jewish faith to understand it. We have to. And that's why I, I, I sometimes find some post-Christian religions, so, or Christian religions that are kind of new and moving, it's almost like they have no regard for the history of what Jesus is meaning when he says things. Like, you know, I am the Lamb of God. You know, that... That means something. It should mean something. It's, it's, it's part of what it might mean for him. But anyway, so, and the use of the law and what the law means. And it prefigures baptism because 
there'll be a new covenant. That's the old covenant. And then the new covenant is instituted with, you know, we all enter into it through baptism. And then you have the epiphany. And one of the things about epiphany is I've got three pictures. Our faith, the truth really is, is we, because we celebrate epiphany and we, and we read the story of the Magi, we often connect the epiphany just with the Magi. However, in the early church, there are three epiphanies because epiphany is, kind of means manifestation. Tell us who, who he is. There are three epiphanies. One is the wedding at Cana. The other one is the visiting of Magi. And the third is the baptism. Because they all speak about, and very early they manifest who Jesus is. Certainly the Magi. We'll, go we'll, we'll explain that to you in a, little, in a second. Um, in the, in the, com, uh, the coming of the wise men or the magi, what we have is the prefiguration of what? Who were the magi or the wise men? They were kings. So what they were not is they were not Jewish, right? They were pagans. And this now, the adoration of, of these pagans who came, because the shepherds were Jews, right? The pagans who came begin to teach us that Jesus' coming is going to be much bigger than just... So even right at the infancy there, right when the visiting of the Magi, we have the foreigners coming and giving adoration. Then the second one is uh, the baptism of the Lord, right, where Jesus is revealed as the Son. This is my beloved Son. And then what does Jesus... Listen to him. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Right? So what you have is a manifestation of Jesus manifesting. Then the next, uh, I mean, it's a manifestation of who Jesus is. Jesus is proclaimed the son. And what you have is the Trinity there, right? Because the dove comes down, the voice of the father. you got the son. All right? Father, son, and Holy Spirit there. And then the last one is the wedding of Cana. And he turns the water into wine which is a manifestation of who Jesus is, is going to turn the, the ordinary in, into something great and, and in abundance. So those in the early church were always considered the three manifestations of who Jesus is uh, in the early church. So that, and they're all epiphanies, by the way. That's why we use the word epiphany for all three of them. There are three epiphanies uh, in the early ether. The next one is then Jesus is presented at the temple. And when he presented at the temple, it, is because the firstborn sons are presented in the temple, and Jesus is that long-expected firstborn son. By the way, I'm at 529, if you're following along. You're 529. All right. And then it's there that we hear who in the temple at the time. Who's in the temple? Simeon, Simeon right, and Anna. And we hear that there he will be contradicted. Mary's heart will be pierced with a sword. So what we have is a, big, the, uh, a foretelling of what's going to happen. He will be assigned. This is the long-expected Messiah. So remember, what I'm doing now, we're all in his life before he even opens his mouth. He doesn't tell us anything. It's what's happening to him that is telling us this. And then the flight into Egypt and the killing of the children, which we say, you know, we remember that that's the exodus, and Jesus is going to free us like he, like the freedom of those from Egypt. So we're connecting it to the freedom. That's why, what's the next connection? If you have him going to Egypt, and he comes out of Egypt, right, just like the Israelites came out of Egypt and were free, what is that going to prefigure? Meaning what, you know the whole story, so what is that going to show? See, so... Let me see if I ask the question, because I know you know the answer. Okay? I know you know the answer. Jesus goes into Egypt, the Holy Family. They come out of Egypt, and they are reliving the history of the Israelite people, right, who go to Egypt, because then all the children are killed, right, under the age of two, just like the, one of the plagues. But then they, he comes out of Egypt, and he starts his ministry, right? That's prefiguring history of, of Israelites who are freed from slavery. What does that event prefigure that will happen in Jesus's life that is just like that? 
close, keep going. And the crucifixion, the new Passover, right? So in that event of going into Egypt and then being freed from Egypt, right? Crossing the Red Sea, we say, being liberated from slavery prefigures the suffering, death, and resurrection that will come forward in the end of his, well, you know, at the end of his life here, where he will free us from our sins and our slavery, right? And how will he do it? He will do it on the same day as the th event that he relived when he was in Egypt, right? That the Israelites lived. See, the connection is that it's not by chance that he just happened to do it on a Passover. It's very clear he chooses Passover because Passover was the old covenant when they were freed from their own sins and slavery and, and bondage. And Jesus now will free us from our sins and slavery and bondage. He will do it on the same way, in the same history, in the same light as the Jewish people. And he becomes the Paschal Lamb that is sacrificed. Exactly. On the post, those who are saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's how we're saved, by the blood of the Lamb. So all of that should kind of like come together, but it's, we're not even, we're only at his experience of coming out of Egypt, right? And it's all, it, these are all going to be, he didn't, he didn't tell us this, he did it. Right, in his hidden life and coming to Egypt. So 531, 532, and 533, I, wanna, I wrote them down. All right? This is a summary of it, though. So 531, is, Jesus shared our human condition. He grew up without greatness, life of labor. He worked like we all work. He was obedient to the law like we all should be obedient. And he lived in a community life like we lived. So he sanctified. We say that he did all of these things and he made them holy. And Jesus was obedient to Mary and Joseph to fulfill the fourth commandment, like we should all be obedient to our parents, right? And uh, connected to his obedience uh, uh, to his father on Holy Thursday, right? So, Father, I'm going to be obedient to you. How, do, how, do you. how can you be obedient to the Father? Well, in your life, you're obedient to your parents. And obedient means listen. It doesn't mean be blind, slave labor, you know, that kind of thing. But there's a, that's, we're going to just save that word for for what it means for them. But what happens sometimes, and we come to realize, is that, and, and the church says this, you know, well, the reason why you pick up your daily crosses and you offer them up and you die to yourself every day is for the day when it will become the time when you have to, you know, hand over your spirit or you have to pick up that big, terrible cross. In other words, you practice this faith in the small things that you do, right? So the only reason we say Jesus was, not the only reason, but he was obedient to his parents in preparation and in commitment to being obedient to God and his father in heaven when the time came. In other words, you, you live this faith in such a way that when, when the time comes for, for you to, when it's called upon you, you have, you have the ability to do it. You know, you have the training, you have the, you've, you've been uh, fortified in it. And what happens for a lot of people, they realize that, and I, you've heard me say this many times, is like, look, you go, you practice the faith now for a time when you will need it. That's why people think that practicing the faith for now, and I'm like, no, you're not practicing it for now, you're practicing it for later. So that when the day you get the diagnosis, you become faithful to Christ. You, you, you turn to him every day for help so that the day when you get the diagnosis that you have cancer or your parents have cancer you know what to do you know how to do it because you've been doing it and what happens i think and this is where i think it's really tragic with the faith and no one's talking about it is that they sort of feel like faith just gets turned on and turned off like a faucet oh you know what when i need faith i'll use uh, i'll get it then and i'm like it, you won't have it it doesn't happen that way. If you take a look, you, you know, you go every day, let's say you go every week to Mass, offer your life every day for the time when you will really have to offer your life. And it will, it'll take everything you got, but you will have known how to do it. And what I see now is people who have left, you know, left the church and they've been, like, been away for 35 years, 
They're burying their parents, let's say. They have no idea what to do. They don't have nothing to lie on. They have nothing to rely on. They don't even know how to pray. They don't know how to talk to God. They say that. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, that's because you haven't practiced it. And then, and what, sometimes what's a shame is when people who live their whole life in the church came to Mass every day, every, once a week, every, whatever, you know, every time. They, they joined all the committees. And then, then their spouse gets cancer and that's it. They, they can't deal with it. And I'm like, what, what have you been doing? What have you been doing while you've been here? right? Haven't you, ha, what gospel have you been reading? You know, I couldn't say that to them then because that's, that's not helpful. But I'm saying it to you now because I want, so that when it happens, we know, you know, like, I, get, I, I, I remember, you know, I mean, I always have that example, I tell you, is that, you know, my parents, my mother died. I, I remember, uh, I, I remember when I've said this sometimes to some of you, so I keep some of my stories. I don't have many of them, but so you get to hear them many times. But I remember doing the funeral of a person um, whose mother died from St. Dom's. It's when I was a chaplain at St. Dom's, okay? And I was at there, and it's, it's so hard, because she was young, she died of cancer, and the kids were crying in the front row. And I was looking over there, and I was kind of emotional, and I was thinking, that will be my family someday sitting there, right? Because my, by that time, my parents hadn't died. And I said, I got to be ready because they will be there one day. It, unless I die first, right? I won't see it. But I'll see it from heaven then. But if I'm there, I might see it from purgatory. <laughs> I'm kidding. I had to get off the story. A little humor in a very serious topic, right? So anyway, uh, so... My mother, my, both my father and mother both had cancer, right? And uh, they died. And I remember um, with my mother, we were all around the bed, right? And she, was t she took her last step, you know, and I said, and she died. She, we, we, we were with her. We spent the all, we all slept in the room. All of us, my whole brothers and sisters slept in the room that night. And she died at noontime, around noontime the next day. And... Um, you know, we all were all there. It was, it was, it was a holy death. We were, all, we were all very supportive of her. Anyway, my point is that my brother went up with his wife because she lived up, he, the, we lived in an apartment building and he lived in the second floor. They owned the house. And my other brother went home with his wife. My sister went home, you know, with her daughter and her wife. And, and I was like, so what do I do? Where do I go, right? As a priest, right? And I'm like, because I was staying at the rectory down the street. And I'm like, they're all going with someone. So what do I do now? So I said to myself, I should celebrate Mass because that's my life with her. I should celebrate Mass for her, right? And so I went into the chapel at the rectory. And I celebrated Mass for my mother because I said, that's what I've practiced, right? For her soul. That's what I believe. And I always give the example because at that moment, I said to myself, why am I doing this? Is this for real? Right? You know how you get the, I got the doubt and I'm like, hmm. But it's what I do and it's what I've done for everybody I know who have died and I would do it for my mother. So I sat, it was a little chapel in, at St. Joseph's Rectory in Bitterford. And I pulled, I tell them this sort of, and I thought, I said, well, it's, it's all I know now, so I, I, I got to do one, right? Because I hadn't celebrated Mass that day because we slept over in our room. So the sacra sacramentary is about bigger than this book, right? It's got over a thousand pages in it. And the back half has a bunch of uh, masses for saints and the first part's on the Advent and Christmas. And so, anyway, this is July, okay? So she died Ju June 30th. She died June 30th. So I took the book, and I put it here, and I opened it up. And then I took the, the, ch the chalice and the wine, and I brought it over to the altar, and I looked at where the book opened up. And it opened up to the feast day 
of St. Cecile, my mother, right? And which is in November. So it, there's no ribbon to it or anything like that, right? It was in the back of the book. And I looked at that and I thought, is that a sign? She's here. She's here with me at Mass, you know? Because that's what I would do, right? And I'll never forget that because then I thought, that's exactly what I should have done because that's what I have practiced. Now, I can't imagine that it would mean anything to me to do that if I had not done that for my life. Do you, do you see? So I use that as an example because pick up your cross every day, offer your life to Christ every day, and then you know how to do it. It's, you practice these things for the time when you have nothing else to do but do it. You know? And when you have nothing else, you pray every day for the time. It doesn't mean everything every day. That's one of the things I really like about it is that you could see in, the, in, the, um, in 531, it's Jesus shared in the human condition growing up without greatness. It's not great to pray every day. You know, it's not, sometimes I feel it, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I get this wonderful little saying, sometimes it's a little kooky, sometimes I'm bored, sometimes I'm tired. But you know, you do it every day. For the day when I have to do it, it's what else am I going to do, right? How else will I understand this? And it's really sad, it's really sad that for someone who lives an entire life, didn't quite catch the spirit. So when the time and the event comes when faith is all you need, you have nothing nothing to lean on. Like you haven't learned how to pray yet. Your whole life you've been a Catholic and you still don't know how to pray. Because for the time when you really needed to pray, you needed to pray. You know, uh, you needed to sit there. And that's why I think, um, uh, no, it was, did I pass it on? Oh yeah. So getting back to Jesus was obedient to Mary and Joseph to fulfill the fourth commandment, connecting his obedience to the Father on Holy Thursday. It prepares him and it forms him, right? It forms him to take on this life. And that's what you should, we all should have been doing as kids, right? We do these events to form us. And some of them are so boring and they're tedious, but yet they give you exactly what you need for the time when you need it. And that's why I say practice your faith. You have to practice it. I tell that to the kids, you know, like, it's like, well, it doesn't mean anything for me to go to church. I'm like, it's not going to mean anything. You're a kid. But it will mean something for you one day. And the day that it means for you something for you, it'll only be because it's been a part of your life and you feel home, right? And this is not foreign to you. You're not walking onto Mars when you come into the church, which is where a lot of people are nowadays. They haven't stepped foot for three, for, you know, tw 10 years. They feel like, you know, I don't know. They change the words. I'm confused now. I don't know. Is it with your spirit or is it also with you? That's how I can often tell. You know, if I'm doing the anointing of the sick with a whole group of family, and I say, the Lord will be with you, and they say, and, we, and also with you, and I'm like, okay, so you guys haven't been to church in a long time, <laughs> right? But, but at least they know the response, right? But uh, I just think, I hope and pray that, you know, that this experience will invite them to kind of practice the faith. But unfortunately, we're in a, we're in a difficult situation now. We've got lots of people with no formation, in the faith, and then they expect it to be able to just like turn it on when they need it. Even Jesus himself, these, it says he was formed by these. You, you, you be a good person now for the time, and be an honest person now in small things, as Jesus says, so that when the big thing for you to be honest with, you'll be ready to be honest, right? So anyway, and then, uh, so entering into fellowship with Jesus in the most ordinary events of our daily lives. Home is a school. That's why I really love that phrase. If you take a look at 533, the home and the growing up of Jesus in his hidden life is where he learned the lessons of silence. They say this is uh, in 533, right? The lesson of silence, of growing up and being bored and quiet. The lessons of family and life and, and uh, as a communion of love and beauty and the sacred. The lessons of work that we say that he picked all that up because he lived the same life we lived. And that's very important that he did. And you find Jesus in the temple. They say it, uh, it broke his silence uh, in the temple because that's the only phrase we have is when he was 12 years old uh, in the, his hidden life. But it shows uh, his total consecration to the mission. And that, that's what that one shows. All right. So that in the hidden life we say of Jesus is our 
hid our life as well. He took it all on. All right? And then the baptism of Jesus starts the question. This is where we, you know, so the first part of it is just is teaching this now. It's like, the big question is, why did Jesus need to be baptized if he didn't have original sin? Right? Why? That's a big question they have, right? So Jesus begins his public life at baptism, right? It was an epiphany, manifestation of his sonship that's found in 535. And then 536. Remember that whenever you ask a question, why? Well, did Jesus have to do this? Right then and there, the answer will always be no. He didn't have to do anything, right? So, in other words, we have to work to get money, right? That's the way it is, all right? We have to do these things, right? He didn't have to come as a human being. What we often will, I think the next question, and this is where the catechism picks it up, is what was he trying to tell us in that he did do it this way? Because that's the teaching that we have. It's like, he, did he have to be born in a manger? The poor, no. But he chose that way, so why did he do it? So he didn't have to be baptized, but he was baptized. And it's clear that he was baptized, and the church made it clear, and it became a controversy in the church. Because like, Jesus, why would he need to be baptized, right? And, and 536 begins to deal with that is that he did not need to be baptized, but he allowed it to be numbered among the sinners. He was going to become one of us because we were all sinners, right? And he submitted to the John's baptism of repentance in order to redeem it. And the Father's voice responds to the Son, and it comes and it rests on him, all right? So we would say that in 537, he gives us the pattern of life. So the Christian must follow Christ and enter into that same kind of humility, of humbling himself, and in the call to repentance, the abasement. So God, you know, goes down into the water with Jesus, rises with him, the Spirit rests on him, right? And he becomes, and is announced as the child of God. You are baptized. Same thing happens to you, right? You humble yourself to, the, to repentance and, and uh, to the life of Christ, Right? You, are, you then rise from that and you become a child of the Father. So that would, just like it said to Jesus, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, he says that to everyone who's baptized. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased, which is you. Right? This is my beloved Son. We're all, that he is well pleased with his creation. You know? and, um, and so that's why we follow the pattern. And then Jesus goes into the, being temptated into temptation and he's into the desert and it's a time of solitude what's it clear to us he is tempted in the very same ways we were tempted but what's important for this attention this the three temptations were three temptations that were going to compromise his mission this is what god had asked him to do and whenever god asks us to do something we always have these temptations to compromise that mission right? To compromise that calling, to kind of get in the way of that calling. So that's one of the reasons why he's like, in the temptations of Satan, this is 540, right? In the temptations, he's tempted by Satan in ways that we, you know, to um, the way we in our, also in our mission in terms of relating to God, turning the stones into bread, right? Uh, the ruling over the nations, using this for your own benefit. Like sometimes I could, you know, tempted to be a priest for my own benefit, you know, live the high life of priesthood, you know, <laughs> right? And uh, go on my, you know, uh, I've just, you, you see, we got a gift as a deck that's being put out there, all right? So I want to live the high life and have my own deck, <laughs> but it was a gift, so the parish didn't pay for it. So, but now I can, we all, we're all excited about having a grill on a deck, because that would be so cool to have to go out there and have uh, discussions and and talk and especially when it's hot in the house to go out and sit on the deck so and cook some hamburgers so anyway <laughs> on the grill small things right but it's cool but uh, you know you could see you could use this for my own life i mean i you know and we've seen priests who have done that right and jesus was tempted to use his messiahship for his own Turn this bread into stone. I made mean, the stone into bread. Get, take what you want from it. You can have everything. You can have it all. 
right? And then ruling over all the nations, right? You could be a powerful king. You could, all this will be yours if you just bow down to me. I'll give it all to you. You'll be so powerful. And he's like, that's not, that's not what I'm going to do with this, with this, right? Or throw yourself down from this place and see if God will, so test God. See if God will really help you. You know, put that kind of doubt in his life. And every Lent, we re recount those, as he says in 540. All right, I'm going to stop right there because it's now 730. Believe it or not, I've been talking for an hour. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions at all? Online, any questions? No? See, it can't be that clear. Come on, guys. Is that right? It is. Okay. Right. All right. You're right. Good. So one of the things that's very important for you to study Jesus is to not just study what he said, but you have to study what happened to him and how that is all a communication to us, what God wants to tell us something. And that's where this hidden life is all about. And, and I think it should, be, it should be wonderful for us as Catholics because we should understand that your home life and the ordinary of your daily life is sanctified by God. Right? I always tell them, they say, like, I want to, some people always say, like, I don't do anything special with my life. And I'm like, yes, but you feed your children. You're feeding the hungry. That's what God, you're nurturing them. You're giving them, you're, you know, you're doing the things God wants you to do with these things. This is sacred. This is, you know, time that you, it's just too bad that it passes by and people don't realize it until after it's done, that this was the holy thing, right? Because Mary did it. Right. You're, do, you're living life with Mary. We got a call. We got a, someone online. Who is it? Diane? Diane. Diane, what is your question? I have, well, it's a question comment. I never realized that he did. I could never feel why he did these simple things. But now I realize it's been sanctified. Absolutely. That is quick. Absolutely. Nice. Well, thank you for... You'll let me sleep in peace. That way, I, something got by. Right? <laughs> something got it. Because, see, there, there is this idea that we, we do say that God, Christ lived through all of this. He really could have just fixed this up like this. He could have done this. You know, right? And it would have all been done. And, and I think that in his great wisdom... Um, he knows that that would never have worked for us, right? That this is the best, this is, this is what will have worked um, and still kept our freedom and all of this stuff. It all comes, it's all this big web, all right? What we're going to move on to is uh, the kingdom of God because that was now, we're going to, we're moving out of the hidden life. He's baptized and now he's going to start his preaching and the primary preaching that he does is the kingdom of God is at hand. That that is no small thing. The kingdom of God is at hand. And he's got parables about the kingdom of God. Um, and he came in to usher the kingdom of God. We say that the kingdom of God has come, but, it's, but it's, it has already broken into this world. But it's not yet fully will be here until he comes again. Because we believe that Jesus will come again. Right? At the end of time. And... Uh, that is another important belief that we have. We pray for him all the time to come again. That he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. So we say that you belong, you're baptized, you now belong to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God or the reign of God. That's where you belong and, you ha and your citizenship is there, not in this world. And if we could just kind of begin to think that way, you know, that you belong to this new, this kingdom of heaven. And, but you have to know what the kingdom of God is. All right? And that, because that was his primary proclamation. The kingdom of God is at hand. You know? So, it's, they always say, well, what's his primary? Well, we have to love one another. Like, right. But, that, you know, that, that is true. He did say that. But, when we love one another, because the kingdom is now here. 
Christ's kingdom. And it's hard for us because we don't have kings anymore in kingdoms. You know, we say the citizenship is how it's get changed now. Your citizenship, you don't belong to this world. Okay? So let's do a little glory be. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So, my fellow citizens of the kingdom, go home and sanctify your life by the very ordinary things of your day. Yeah, it's not Hollywood. It's not, it's not the glamorous life. It's, it's the life God has instilled for us. I still think the Amish, they got it right. They really do. All right, no questions online? Kind of froze online for us. All right, good night. All right, good night, guys.